Did you know, fun fact, that there are over 100 different types of, can you guess? Translation? Different types of bread. That's right. There are over 100 different types of bread. Now, in a room this size, I bet there's quite the, the differing opinions on the types of bread that you should be eating. Somebody tell me, what's your favorite type of bread? Just yell it out. Sourdough. Sour, sourdough. How many of you know how to make sourdough? You know, like you make, the guys? You have a starter. Did you make the starter or did you like inherit it? Did you go there to get the starter? Did you buy it? Yeah. It's like, it's like a hundred years old sequel. <laughs> <laughs> He's, did you like drive there for the starter? Well, that was like you got in the car going. Okay. Does anyone have? Does anyone have a sourdough starter older than a hundred years? You do. How old is yours? Two hundred years old. Where did that thing come from? Who started it? Do you know? That is crazy. Some people pass down a Bible. You got a sourdough starter. <laughs> so that's awesome. <laughs> Does anyone have any other types of breads? Or is it just sourdough? We're unanimous. We're united on this. What's regular bread? White bread? Oh, no. <laughs> White bread. Oh, my goodness. That reminds me, like, when I was a kid, I used to, like, eat, like, ham sandwiches on white bread. It gets stuck to the top of my mouth. Oh, man. White bread. That brings me back. I, I think it's been, like, well, actually, that's not true. When we did Winter Weekend, we made the sandwiches with white bread. So that was the last time I had white bread. Like, once. I've had it twice in, like, the last eight years. Anyways, 200-year-old starters. Didn't expect that, but that's awesome. There are over 100 different types of bread. Did you know that bread is perhaps one of the most, if not the most, consumed foods in all of the planet. That is one of the most consumed foods, right? I bet there's 500-year-old sourdough starters out there somewhere in, I don't know, Europe. Europe feels like a sourdough haven for, for people. I don't know. Uh, but bread is uh, one of the most commonly ate foods uh, in the entire world. Now, bread, why are we talking about bread? Bread in the Bible is a consistent image, an illustration that is used again and again and again to make spiritual truths or to uh, illustrate spiritual truths. So in John 6, Jesus is the what? The bread of life. Here's another one. I don't remember the reference, but not, wait, wait, man shall not live on bread alone. Uh, tonight, Jesus is going to feed 4,000 people with, you guessed it, bread. bread, and then, and fish, bread and fish. And then later on, we're going to see the disciples, they make this whole fiasco out of forgetting their bread. They had all this bread, Jesus feeds the 4,000, they get in the boat and they're like, oh, we forgot the bread. And then Jesus is upset with them because they don't have understanding about what the bread is really all about. But in the Bible, Bread is used again and again and again to illustrate, to make spiritual points, to teach us certain things, most especially in the Gospels about Jesus. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight, how bread, maybe not sourdough, but bread is a broader category, points to Jesus. So if you've got your Bibles, open up to Mark chapter 8. We're going to cook through 26 verses this evening, but we're going to try to do it in a way that makes sense. Uh, but I want you to look, as we read it together, I want you to look and take note of all the different times that bread is mentioned, whether it's obvious or, or not. There's going to be uh, several mentions of bread, which is why we're talking about how bread points to Jesus. So Mark chapter 8, let's begin reading in verse 1. In those days, when again a crowd, a great crowd had gathered and they had nothing to eat, 
he called his disciples, Jesus, and said to them, I have compassion on the crowd, because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way, and some of them have come from far away. And his disciples answered him, how can one feed these people with bread here in this desolate place? Flag on the play. Where in Mark have we seen Jesus feed people with bread in a desolate place? Can you remember? The feeding of the 5,000. Bonus points if you know what chapter. Six. Mark chapter six. The feeding of the 5,000, which in that specific story, it says 5,000 men, and we assume they have families. So it's really kind of in the 10, 15, 20,000 range. Jesus takes bread and multiplies it to all these people on a mountain. He takes a seat on the mountain. And yet, we have a greater, we have a great crowd, a smaller crowd here, far less, 4,000 total. And the disciples are like, whoa, Jesus, how are we going to get bread to these people here in this desolate place? Take note of that. And he asked them, Jesus, how many loaves do you have? And they said, seven. And he directed the crowd to sit down on the ground, and he took the seven loaves, and having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to set before the people, and they set them before the crowd. And they had a few small fish, and having blessed them, he said that these also should be set before them. And they ate and were satisfied. So not only did everyone eat, they were satisfied. They were full. They could rest easy that night because they had plenty in their stomachs. And they took up, in fact, the broken pieces left over, seven baskets full. And there were about 4,000 people, and he sent them away. And immediately he got into the boat with his disciples and went to the district of Dalmanutha. Now, here we go. Let's pause for a second. We have Jesus feeding 4,000 people about bread, after he's already done that with 10, 15, 20,000 people, and the disciples are right there. Remember, they were distributing the bread to the Jews back then. They've seen Jesus do this, and yet they ask him, hey, how are we going to get this done? We're in the middle of nowhere. He feeds them, and here's what we have next in verse 11. The Pharisees came and began to argue with Jesus, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. A sign? Didn't Jesus just feed 4,000 people with seven loaves of bread? What more do you want? But they want a sign. And he sighed deeply in his spirit. He sighed deeply. That type of sigh that your parents give you when they ask you to wash the dishes and you didn't do it. Right? That's what we're talking about here. He sighed deeply. He was frustrated in his spirit and said, why does this generation seek a sign? Truly I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. And he left them, got into the boat again, and went to the other side. Now here we pick it up again with more bread. Verse 14. Now they had forgotten to bring bread. Oh, dang it, we're in the boat. We left all the bread, we're hungry. And they had only one loaf with them in the boat. Imagine, I don't know how many were there, 12, dividing a loaf of bread amongst themselves. They're ravenously hungry, even though it just said they were satisfied. But they forgot the bread, they're in the boat, they've got one loaf between all of them. And so they had forgotten. And, and Jesus, he says in verse 15, cautioned them saying, watch out. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. <laughs> they start thinking, they're in their minds, man, we've got one loaf of bread. Jesus tries to teach them something. And what are they thinking about? We got no bread. <laughs> Jesus, what are you talking about? The loaves, uh, we're talking about the, the leaven of the Pharisees. And we just, we're hungry, Jesus. And they began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. Imagine Jesus standing in front of you, trying to teach you something, and you're going, okay, but can I eat though? Like, where's the food at? That's kind of what the disciples are doing. Verse 17, and Jesus, aware of this, said to them, why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? You fools, do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember? Hmm. When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, 12. And the seven for the 4,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, seven. And he said to them, do you not yet understand? Do you not understand about the bread? So Jesus is like, hey, I'm doing these things. And it has to do with bread and feeding people. Do you not understand what all of this means? And clearly, they don't fully understand it. And now let's look at verse 22 for the last section here. 
And they came, Jesus with the disciples, they came to Bethsaida, and some people brought to him a blind man and begged him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. And when he had spit on his eyes and laid his hands on him, he asked, Do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see people, but they look like trees walking. Then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again, and he opened his eyes. His sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. And he sent him to his home, saying, do not even enter the village. Now, lots of things going on. We've got the feeding of the 4,000, the Pharisees kind of coming out of nowhere, demanding a sign, the disciples in the boat thinking about bread while Jesus is trying to teach them, and then it finishes with Jesus healing a blind man. What can we take from all of this? But again, we're, we're trying to trace the theme of bread and, and how it points to Jesus and how it teaches us about Jesus. That's what we start with, the feeding of the 4,000. That kind of sets the stage, right? We know that story. It's familiar. It's very similar in a lot of ways to the story of the feeding of the 5,000, uh, kind of set up in the same way. The disciples serve. They, they uh, take up baskets of leftovers. Everyone's filled. Everyone's satisfied. It's miraculous. Only Jesus, the Son of God, could do something like this. And so we understand that. And the first people that come to Jesus after the sign are the Pharisees. So Jesus, by the way, up until this point, we're eight chapters into the Gospel of Mark. Jesus has raised a girl from the dead. Jesus has healed a woman with the issue of blood that she had had for 12 years. Uh, Jesus has cast out many demons. He has healed many leopards. He has done all kinds of things. Remember Legion, right? He banishes a, a, a thousand demons into the pig, pigs, and they jump off the cliff into the water. Jesus has done all kinds of things, things that you and I can't do, <laughs> things that are signs of who Jesus is as the Savior. Again and again and again, Jesus heals, and he teaches, and he authenticates his teaching with his miracles, and he does it again and again and again, and he does it publicly, and he does it privately. He does it out in the streets, and he does it in the privacy of someone's home. He does it in all kinds of ways, with all kinds of signs, tr pointing to the truth that he is the King, the Messiah, the one that they've been waiting for. And yet, look at verse 11. The Pharisees came and began to argue with him. Now imagine that. Jesus just feeds a bunch of people with seven loaves of fish and a, or seven loaves of bread and a few small fish. He does this miraculous thing. He cares for the people because he has compassion on them. What's the Pharisees' response? They're ready to fight. They want to argue with Jesus. The Pharisees came and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. A sign from heaven after they theoretically, at least the way it's written in this passage, after they just saw and witnessed this miraculous feeding of the 4,000, or at the very least, they must have heard, because they're in the region, by the way, of the demoniac. The demoniac was around this region, uh, telling of what Jesus had done. That was the guy with the legion in him. And yet the Pharisees came and began to argue with him, seeking for him a sign from heaven to test him. Now, this is something that as a, as a high schooler in 2024, that honestly, I think, not just you guys, but all of us, this is something that we struggle with. We struggle with demanding from God uh, perhaps further proof, proof of his uh, existence, of his goodness, of his character, of his intentions, of his nature. Uh, we often point the finger at God in, in those times of doubt or perhaps in those times of anger or those times of sorrow. We point our fingers at God and we say, God, show me that you truly are God, that you truly are good. And we do something similar to what the Pharisees have done here in our passage. So point number one this evening, things that we can learn from this whole story is don't be a stubborn sign seeker. Don't be a stubborn sign seeker. Now, here's a question that I was asking myself. Why are they asking for a sign, and why is Jesus not giving them a sign? <laughs> These are the questions, right? We always want to be asking questions, like we did last week of the text. Why are they asking for a sign, and why is Jesus not giving them a sign? Well, really, in the original language, it's, it's less of a genuine question and more of an accusation. That's why it starts in verse 11. They began to argue with him. 
They're not interested in proof. They're not interested in verifying who Jesus is. Uh, They're interested in arguing. They're interested in being dismissive. They're interested in continuing in their doubt. They have no interest in an actual sign. There's not a a sense of authentic faith. Uh, There's none of that. They want to accuse Jesus. They want to point their finger at Jesus. So Jesus is frustrated by that again and again and again. He does miracle after miracle, sign after sign, and not just the Pharisees, sometimes the disciples, sometimes the crowd, people don't get it. They don't understand. And they point their finger at Jesus, and they say, Jesus, if you're really Jesus, even though you've healed, even though you've raised from the dead, even though you've done all kinds of things that are only true to be uh, of someone that is beyond human capability, uh, you've done all of these things, I want you to show me a sign. I want a cloud to form in the sky that says, this is the person that I'm supposed to date. I think that's what I want. I want a sign. I I want uh, something to pop up in my life to, to show me that you're real, to show me that you exist. My encouragement, and I think even the point of this particular part of the story, is that Jesus is saying, don't be a stubborn sign seeker. A stubborn sign seeker is someone that lacks faith, is someone that ignores all of the evidence for Christ, uh, especially recorded in the Bible, uh, someone that can see any amount of evidence that they possibly could want, and yet it doesn't satisfy them. That's what the Pharisees have. They have miracles, they've got teaching, they've got all kinds of things, and yet they continue to doubt Jesus. They are stubborn sign seekers. And that's why Jesus doesn't indulge their question. That's why he doesn't answer them. That's why he doesn't give them a sign. First of all, it's not a horse and pony show. Jesus is not out there flexing his ability to do miraculous things. Uh, But secondly, they're not asking so that they can believe. Uh, They're asking so that they can discredit Jesus. And so often I find in our modern context, uh, either uh, before we're Christians or sometimes after we're a Christian, we have the same tendency as the Pharisees to point our fingers at Jesus or at God and to demand a sign. Show me that you're real. And that's what you're going to hear, right? If we think about this apologetically, that's what we did last week. Apologetically meaning uh, there are critiques and questions sort of lobbed at Christians and the authenticity of the Bible and its truthfulness. One of the questions is, where's the proof? Where's the sign? Give me a sign. Give me a cloud. Give me a lightning bolt. Uh, Give me whatever. Uh, I need to see a sign before I can believe in Jesus. Now, now some of that uh, could be genuine. Some of that could be. Uh, We can certainly ask questions. Uh, We can certainly inquire about Jesus and the Bible and his truthfulness and its perhaps relevance for us. We can do those things in a posture of faith, but oftentimes, We don't, especially the world doesn't. The signs that they demand uh, are foolishness. They're they're, they're, they're signs that ultimately, even if they were to to see them, they still wouldn't believe. And you say, well, how could that be? Uh, Because all throughout the Gospels, all throughout the Gospel of Mark, how many miracles has Jesus done in front of a very large group of people? I don't know the exact number, I should have counted, but a lot, (laughs) lots of miracles, lots of miracles in front of lots of people, and what do they do? They don't believe. They look at Jesus healing this woman with the issue of blood, they look at Jesus resurrecting from the dead a little girl, they look at Jesus healing the leopard, making the blind to see, allowing the, the, the deaf to hear and the mute to speak and they still don't believe. They see it. They see him standing in front of them. In fact, earlier in the Gospel of Mark, we studied this a while ago, I think it's Mark 3, they attribute the miraculous things of Jesus to Satan. So they acknowledge that he's doing powerful things. They have to acknowledge that. But they refuse to acknowledge that Jesus is the Christ, that he's the Messiah, that he's the King. So they have to explain away the things that he's doing. And how do they do that? This was Satan. They say this was empowered by Beelzebul. So don't tell me that in this world, in this life, if there was a mountain of physical signs or evidence, that the world would suddenly become Christianized. 
Because when Jesus was physically here on earth, doing every sign under the sun in front of large and massive crowds, they continued in their unbelief. And so our purpose is this evening, don't be a stubborn sign seeker. The author of Hebrews kind of defines faith and what it means to have faith. And he defines faith as the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And even uh, the, the, the Bible tells us uh, that it's, it's better for people that don't see God and yet believe in him. It's better. It's, it's, it's better even, Jesus says in the Gospel of John, it's better that I leave. Think about that. Have you ever asked yourself, why did Jesus leave? Like, why couldn't he have stayed on earth still doing all the things so that if someone was like, show me a sign, I could just go, look, he's right over there. I mean, wouldn't that be easier? Wouldn't more people believe? Why is it better? Uh, well, Jesus says his leaving sends the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit leads us into all truth about Christ. And it doesn't require us to see Christ healing. And don't be deceived. Don't, don't be the person that thinks that you would believe if Jesus was standing in front of you when we have countless examples of people in the Bible standing in front of Jesus not believing. <laughs> we all think uh, that we would be the person. Well, yeah, if I saw it, I'd believe. I mean, they didn't. Oh, and they didn't. Oh, and again, they didn't. Oh, and the Pharisees didn't. And sometimes the disciples don't. And, and the disciples, they don't. But I would. I, I, would, I would believe. Uh, that's just not the case. Uh, and part of it is uh, because we talked about this earlier. It's spiritual blindness. It's the inability to see spiritual truth. It's the inability uh, to understand what Jesus is teaching and the significance of it. That's what Paul talks about. That the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing that spiritual things must be discerned by spiritual people. And so even if Jesus himself was standing in this room and he did something miraculous, there's a good chance that some of you, if not many of you, would go, nah, that was probably fake. I don't, I don't believe it. I mean, I think maybe if he had done like a sourdough type of thing, maybe, but other than that, I'm not sure. So, so don't be someone that needs to have something that other people had and yet still rejected Christ. It's, it's more, uh, it, it, there's a sense in which the Bible talks about there, there's a deeper, sort of richer faith that we can have now that Christ isn't physically on earth than the people that were in the pages of Scripture that were rejecting, denying Christ, even though he stood right in front of them. Don't be a stubborn sign seeker. Now, here's where Jesus kind of makes things interesting. So we've got the Pharisees, they're seeking a sign. Jesus is upset, he's frustrated. They're not truly seeking a sign. They're accusing him, they're just filled with doubt. They're trying to trip him up. Um, so Jesus says, no sign will be given. And he left them, got into the boat again, and went to the other side. Now here's where we get kind of an interesting scene between Jesus and the disciples. Now this is telling. Let's look at it in verse 14. It says, now the disciples had forgotten to bring bread. They had only one loaf with them in the boat. And Jesus cautioned them saying, watch out. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Someone tell me what leaven is. It makes the bread rise. Exactly right. Jesus says, watch out for the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod, watch out for the thing that's going to increase something that's negative, something that we want to avoid. And what is that thing? It's the type of doubt and disbelief that the Pharisees demonstrate by coming to Jesus and demanding a sign. He says, watch out for that. Watch out for that because it's going to continue to grow. It's going to grow and it's going to grow and it's going to grow. It's going to cause, so to speak, the bread to rise. And ultimately, this is kind of even a foreshadowing of Jesus' death because it is going to grow. The doubt's going to grow. Uh, the disbelief is going to grow, and it's going to lead to them uh, putting to death Jesus on the cross. So he says, watch out. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Now, the disciples, here's how they respond in verse 16. They began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? bread. Do you not yet perceive or understand? So we have the Pharisees coming up to Jesus, accusing him, trying to trip him up, demanding a sign. There's a sense of 
unbelief. There's a sense of they don't truly get it. They don't see Jesus for who he is, and they want him to perform like a, like a magician or to just dance to their every whim and will. And Jesus says, no, I'm not going to do it. That's, that's not what I'm here for. And even the disciples, they are discussing the fact that they have no bread, and they don't perceive or understand. They don't get it. They don't get the full picture about what this illustration of bread is meant to reveal about Jesus. In fact, he says, are your hearts hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? They said to him, 12. And the seven for the 4,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, seven. And he said to them, do you yet under, do you not yet understand? Now here's kind of where we see this truth really play itself out. We've got the Pharisees, they're doubting, uh, they don't understand. Uh, their doubt is certainly a lack of faith. We have the disciples uh, who are at least confused. They're confused about all of these things. They're not quite getting uh, the point. There's these spiritual truths that Jesus keeps trying to reveal to them, to teach them, and it seems like they keep missing it again and again and again. And that's point number two for you this evening. Grow in discerning spiritual truth. Grow in being able to discern spiritual truth. And know that this is a process. This is something that takes time. This is not something that's instantaneous like we would want with some sort of sign. This is not some sort of instantaneous, uh, we get it, we got it. There's nothing else, there's nothing more, that's all she wrote. That's not how this works. There's this sort of growing in spiritual truth. And we see that with the disciples all throughout the Gospel of Mark. They have these questions and Jesus pulls them aside and he tries to teach them. They don't quite understand, but they get bits and pieces of it. And even later at the end of chapter 8, Jesus is going to go to the disciples, specifically Peter, and ask them, who do people say that I am? That's the next section. So Jesus is kind of culminating. He's building towards this, who am I? Who do people say that I am? Who do they believe me to be? And all of that is spiritual truth that can be only discerned by spiritual people. And that's what we see here in the disciples. Do you not perceive? Do you not understand? Are your hearts hardened? Now, it's much like, uh, in a sense, it's not a perfect illustration, but um, a while back, this was years ago, we don't even have this car anymore, but I went to the dealership uh, and I got my wife a car. It was a 2013 Kia Sorento. Uh, and that thing was a piece of junk. Um, the engine got recalled. I mean, it was a, it was a nightmare. I think the time, we, we only had it a couple years, but I think the time that we had it, we got like two recall letters from Kia. Everything under the sun was wrong with this car. Uh, but I remember when I first got it, I had never really had a Kia before. And so when I was driving on the road, I just didn't notice them. I didn't notice the Kia. But when I was rocking and rolling in my 2013 Kia with a faulty engine, I started to see Kias all over the place, right? Oh, there's a Kia. Oh, we're driving the same car, right? And then you're honking the horn. I didn't do that. Uh, but there, oh, I see, I see Kias everywhere. There, there's a sense in which I can see something that I hadn't yet been able to see before, or at least not in the same way. It didn't stick out to me as much. And there seems to be some elements of that here with this spiritual truth where they're seeing things, but maybe not in the full picture, and they're growing in it. And Jesus is just piece by piece is giving them more of the picture, and it's becoming clear, but it's still not quite there, because even in Peter in the next section, he's going to say, you are the Christ, and we're like, yes, Peter, we get it, you get it, but then what does he do? He denies Christ three times before the rooster goes cock a doo doo right? Is that what a rooster says? Yeah, anyways, Peter denies him, and so we get it. There's a sense of like, there's this progressive understanding of truth. And we can grow in discerning spiritual truth. So let's unpack this. Jesus is asking them, why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? He's making this spiritual point. Do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Have you, have, having eyes, do you not see? Really, it gets into the nitty-gritty here in uh, verses 19 through 21. He says, when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, 12. 
Now, if you remember last week, there was this weird story about Jesus talking to the Syrophoenician woman. Dogs were involved, bread, Israel, Jew first, also the Greek. Uh, Jesus goes northwest, you remember, to Tyre and Sidon. Uh, so he's kind of expanding his ministry to the Gentiles. We talked about that last week. Um, and there seems to be kind of some overtones in this of referring back to that. Well, how could that be? Well, the number 12. Jesus is, Jesus is making a big deal about this number 12. He's going to make a big deal about the number 7. So again, if we're good Bible readers, we're going to go, why? <laughs> we shouldn't just go, well, 12 and 7, great. Those are nice numbers. Together they make 19. If you multiply them, it's 84. Uh, if you add them, I just did that, 19. Uh, whatever, right? We should be asking, why is he making a point about this, 12 and 7? Well, think about this. 12, what's significant about the number 12 from a biblical perspective? 12 disciples, that's true. What's the 12 tribes of Israel? So we have Jesus making this point. He's using bread and the feeding of the 5,000. And he says, well, we started, and the feeding of the 5,000 was to a Jewish audience. We know that because of the way that it's written in Mark chapter 6. It's to a Jewish audience. That was right after Jesus was rejected at Nazareth, and he left there and surrounded by Jews, great crowd, in Mark chapter 6. So there's a Jewish audience. There's 12 baskets left over, and those 12 baskets represent the 12 tribes of Israel. So we go, okay, cool. That's nice to know. Verse 20, and the seven for the 4,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, seven. So again, we're asking, why seven? What's significant about the number seven in the Bible? What do we think? The number of completion, seven days of creation. Uh, there's actually kind of a lot of things that are significant. There were seven Gentile nations surrounding Israel, uh, particularly in the Old Testament. They're named in a couple of different passages. Uh, God created the world in six days and rested on the seventh. So there's the idea of the Sabbath. And earlier in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. And then we've got the uh, number of seven in terms of the number of completion. So we've got rest, Sabbath, creation, Gentile nations. Uh, which one of these makes the most sense in this context? Well, if 12 represents the 12 tribes of Israel, seven is going to be the seven Gentile nations. So, and, he's, and we can say that because in uh, Mark chapter 8, which is where we are, he's feeding the 4,000 in a Gentile area. So it's primarily a Gentile audience whom he's feeding. So he's done two feeding miracles. The first is to Jews. The second is to Gentiles. And so he says, I broke the five loaves, and there was 12 baskets left over. It was the 12 tribes. Then I broke the seven loaves, and there was seven baskets left over. And it's the seven Gentile nations, or just the Gentile people in general. So Jesus is again drawing our attention back to chapter 7, where Jesus talks about that his uh, you know, ministry was to the Jew first, but also to the Greek. And he's showing that in this sort of miraculous type of way through the feeding of the 5,000, and he's frustrated with his disciples because they don't get it. They don't understand the significance. And that may seem obscure, and from our perspective, you're kind of like, well, that's unfair, Jesus. Like 12 and 7, I mean, that, those are random numbers. But these meant a lot to the audience through whom Jesus is interacting with, through the disciples. The 12 uh, was a significant number in the nation of Israel. Uh, how many stars are on the American flag? 50, right? That's something that we typically know off the top of our heads. Uh, so th if there are things that are meaningful to us, maybe less meaningful in our current culture, but things like that, and people are making those connections, are going to be a little bit more obvious to us. And that's what Jesus is saying. The 12 baskets equal the 12 tribes, and the seven baskets equal the, equal the seven uh, Gentile nations. And, and what's the point? What's Jesus trying to say? I came to provide for the Jews and the Gentiles, for the whole world, for everyone. I came to provide. That's what food is. I came to meet their needs. I came to satisfy them. I came to, to give them something uh, that would ultimately fill, fill them in a spiritual sense. And that's when we were teaching through the feeding of the 5,000. Uh, it was basically talking about our greatest need. I don't know if you remember that. Our greatest need, we said, was not bread. 
right? Our greatest need is Christ. He is the greatest need that meets our greatest desire and that gives us the greatest satisfaction. And so that's what Jesus is saying. I came here to satisfy. I came to seek and to save the lost. To the Jew first, that's what he did in Mark 6 with the feeding of the 5,000, but also to the Greek, to the Gentile. That's what he's doing here in Mark chapter 8. He's showing them again and again, here is why I came. I came so that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And the disciples, they continue to misunderstand it. But we see again in the Gospel of Mark that spiritual truth requires uh, growing in discernment, requires growing in our ability. Even we're looking at a passage, and I don't know if many of you would have read this and been like 12 baskets equals 12 tribes of Israel. And I'm not pointing fingers. I'm just saying that spiritual truth requires growing in discernment, being able to de- determine what is significant in this passage, what's going on here. And that's what Jesus is pointing us to. Now let's kind of go back to verse 22, because there's this blind man at Bethsaida, and this seems like a left fielder. But again, we're trying to be good Bible readers, trying to ask good questions. Why does this come after 4,000 people are fed, the Pharisees demand a sign, uh, the disciples continue to complain that they don't have any bread, Jesus makes this spiritual point about bread, and now there's this random guy healed from his blindness. What's going on here? Let's look at it. And they came to Bethsaida, and some people brought to him a blind man and begged him to touch him. Now again, if we're astute in our Bible reading, we should go, okay, we've heard that phrasing before at the end of chapter 7. And they brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment, and they begged him to lay his hand on him. End of chapter 7. They begged him, and so to speak, or at least the the, the later portion of chapter 8, they begged Jesus. So there's this sort of connection maybe that we're seeing between these two passages. He took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. And when he had spit on his eyes and laid his hands on him, he asked them, do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see people, but they look like trees walking. Then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again, and he opened his eyes. His sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. And he sent him to his home saying, do not enter or even enter the village. Now the question, you should ask questions. The question is, could Jesus not have healed this guy in one swoop? Why does Jesus do part one, part two? (laughs) Because every other healing that we've seen, at least so far, has been instantaneous. In fact, in chapter seven, when he heals the little girl of the demon, he's not even near her. So he doesn't you know, physically touch her. He's not even in proximity to her. And yet he says, go to your house. She's healed. And, and she went home and found the child laying in bed and the demon gone. That's what it says. So why is Jesus doing part one, part two? <laughs> is it because he lacks power? Well, obviously we, we know that's not the case because Jesus raises someone from the dead. He's got power over life and death itself. So why is he doing this? What's the, the purpose in this? If you remember back at the end of chapter 7, what is it that Jesus is healing from this guy? Do you remember? His deafness and his un- inability to, to mute, or to mute, his inability to, to speak because he's mute, his inability to unmute. Um, yikes. So there's this, this story about Jesus healing a guy that can't hear and then the, the, the latter part of chapter 8, there's a story about Jesus healing this guy that can't see. And right before that, Jesus talking to his disciples, what does he say? Verse 18, having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? Okay, wait, there's, there's a theme here. The Bible makes sense. <laughs> there's continuity in this. Okay, what's Jesus' point? I mean, okay, let's start with the question of why does he do it in two parts? He does it in two parts, again, to illustrate the ongoing and increasing clarity that the disciples and others are having about Christ. And he's going to get even more specific at the end of chapter 8, and he's going to talk about, I'm going to have to die. I'm going to have to go to the cross. Uh, it says, the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy, before the holy uh, angels. Right? What it says here, 
Uh, Forever would lose his, who lose his life for my sake. Whoever gains his life will save it. Um, let him deny himself, take up his cross, follow me. He's talking about his death and his resurrection. So there's this increasing clarity that people are having about Jesus, but they still don't get it. And so part one, part two is not, oh man, I, I didn't get it quite right the first time. It, it's a physical illustration of a spiritual reality that people in this text are seeing Jesus in some sense, maybe some shadowy figure, maybe some glimpses of who Jesus is, of the significance of what he came to do, but they don't see it fully. That, that's going to come later, and especially on the cross when he dies, when he resurrects from the dead, when he ascends to the right hand. They don't see it fully. So there's this one, step one, step two, and Jesus is using a physical illustration to teach a spiritual truth. Now, what does this all have to do with hearing and seeing? Well, again, the whole thing is really kind of centered around bread, a bread that points ultimately to Jesus and the satisfaction that you can find in him. A bread, uh, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. In Jesus, there is bread. In Jesus, there's contentment. In Jesus, there's fulfillment. In Jesus, there's provision. In Jesus, you have everything that you need. That's what this story is pointing us to. But the people around Jesus, they don't seem to get it. They're hearing Jesus' teaching. They're seeing Jesus' miracles. But yet there's groups of people, and even the Pharisees are maybe a more dramatic example, that come to Jesus after hearing and after seeing, and they still don't hear, and they still don't see. Because they deny, and they accuse, and they seek more signs than the signs that they've already been given. They don't hear, and they don't see. And so our responsibility as we read through the Scriptures, as we read about our Savior, is to grow in discerning what it's actually saying about Jesus and the significance of what it means for us. Because Jesus feeds the 5,000, the 12 tribes of Israel. Jesus feeds the 4,000, the seven Gentile nations. He's making this point, I am the bread of life. I came to give you everything that you need. And yet people, again, seem to not get it. And so my desire for you guys as high school students is that you wouldn't get tripped up or lost uh, when it comes to discerning spiritual truth. My desire is that you would see the scriptures, that you would read them, that you would hear them, and that you would actually hear what they're saying, and that you would actually see what they mean, and that you would actually know and understand their significance, and that people aren't coming to you and go, well, didn't we just talk about this? What does this mean? And what is the significance of that? I want us to understand and discern spiritual truth. And really, all that starts with having a right relationship with Christ. Right? If you don't have a right relationship with Christ, all of this is hogwash. It doesn't make any sense, right? Because spiritual truth is only understood by spiritual people. And so the Bible, it's going to seem like gibberish because in a lot of ways it is. The Spirit is not in you helping you to understand. But even as Christians, we can get things wrong. We can uh, perhaps doubt Jesus. We can grow in unbelief of Jesus and his character and his power and his authority and the reason why he came. And Jesus wants to make it clear, I came so that people could have life in me, so that they could be provided for, so that they could be fully satisfied. And I want them to hear and I want them to see. I want them to understand, which is why in verses 27 through 30, Jesus says, who do you say that I am? He's been building to this point. He's been teaching. He's been demonstrating again and again and again. He wants people to get it. He wants it, people to understand that in Christ and in Christ alone is true life found. And that's what we'll cover the next time that we're together when we talk about uh, Peter's confession of Christ and even Jesus foretelling his death and resurrection. But I want you to understand, spiritual truth is discerned by spiritual people, and we can grow in that. And as we grow in that, we'll understand the significance of Jesus' words and be able to live our lives in ways uh, that really reflect understanding the significance of Jesus' words and how they transform our lives as a result. Let's pray together. God, I thank you uh, for this story of Jesus, the story kind of using bread to illustrate the things of Jesus, to illustrate truths about who he is. And Father, I pray that we uh, as a group, 
uh, would understand the things of Jesus, that we would read your word and our heart would not be filled with doubt. Our heart would not uh, seek to accuse Jesus and demand some sort of sign to authenticate himself, but rather we would read your word, that we would recognize it as being from you, that we would trust in the things that are held within the pages of Scripture, that we devote our lives to it, and that we would ultimately see that in Christ and in Christ alone, there is life, and and there is satisfaction, there is fulfillment in Christ. And Father, I pray that if there are students here that don't know that, that don't experience that, that you'd open their eyes today, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.